Opening day is upon us. Giants baseball is set to return, and the Kerry Crowley Show is back on YouTube. Folks, it's been quite an off season. When I first started this show in late August of last year, the Giants were falling apart. It was an organization without a direction. It was a team that clearly needed to make significant changes, and the first step in making those changes was firing manager Gabe Kapler, hiring new manager Bob Melvin away from the San Diego Padres, and beginning a long off season of high-profile acquisitions that continued last week with the addition of Cy Young left-hander Blake Snell. So let's get into all of this here. A real quick recap of the offseason before I bring in my friend Roger Munter to help preview this 2024 Giants season. The Giants fire Kapler at the end of last year. They hire Bob Melvin, who brings in a more traditional and maybe more established coaching staff that is expected to blend some of the old and the new. The analytics with the gut instincts, Giants fans were thrilled to see Bob Melvin come back to the Bay Area and come home to the team that he grew up rooting for. And then the Giants made a big splash at the beginning of the offseason, bringing in outfielder Jung Hoo Lee, who was an excellent player in the KBO, signing him to the largest free agent contract the organization had ever given to a position player. But at that point, the offseason was still relatively disappointing because Giants fans had lost out on Shohei Otani, who'd signed with the Los Angeles Dodgers at 10 years, $700 million. Giants fans had missed out on Yoshinobu Yamamoto, who signed with the Los Angeles Dodgers at 10 years and $325 million. You'd seen Tyler Glass now go to the Dodgers. You'd seen Teoscar Hernandez go to the Dodgers. It just felt like the gap was ever widening. And it put the importance on Farhan Zaidi and the rest of the Giants front office, and, spe and specifically the Giants ownership group, to go out and spend money to put together a product that could be more compelling, more entertaining, and ultimately more competitive. And by opening day, I believe they have done that. I've been critical throughout the offseason, particularly on this YouTube channel, when I've hosted shows, and on KMBR, on pressing the Giants to spend more money. I felt like it was important to try to close that huge gap with the Los Angeles Dodgers and try to compete in a National League that beyond the Braves and the Dodgers seems to be wide open. It felt like there were so many solid free agent players available and the Giants appear to have capitalized. I questioned the addition of Jordan Hicks, four years, $44 million, and I still don't know what he'll look like as a member of the starting rotation over 162 game season. But his, if his final exhibition start is anything indicative of what's to come, Jordan Hicks has a really bright future. And keep in mind, he's younger than Tristan Beck, who was initially penciled in for a rotation spot before he went down at the beginning of spring training. Then they sign Jorge Soler to the three-year $42 million contract. Instant impact in the lineup. Soler brings much-needed power to a Giants lineup that, of course, has not had a 30-home run hitter since Barry Bonds. Soler is the type of player who I think opponents have to game plan around, and who I think you know can strike fear in opposing pitchers in the eighth and ninth inning of ball games when the Giants are down a run or two. That's something that they've lacked for the last several years. Then the additions continue. Matt Chapman on the whether you wanted to call it a three-year, fifty-four million dollar deal or a one-year, twenty million dollar deal. The bottom line is Matt Chapman signed for a more, far more reasonable contract than any of us anticipated at the outset of the offseason. I think that the Giants made a significant upgrade over J.D. Davis at third base. And I know that a lot of people will disagree with that take, but I'll tell you this, wins above replacement. Chapman last season with the Toronto Blue Jays, his war was just above four. J.D. Davis for his career has not reached that total. He's never played more than 150 games in a season, something that Matt Chapman does. The Giants were lacking continuity. They were lacking stability. They were lacking athleticism and defense. And Matt Chapman brings all of that to the table. And now, just, what, 10 days ago, they agreed to terms on the deal with Blake Snell. Two years, $62 million. That's really a one-year, $30 million deal or so. If Blake Snell pitches well, if Matt Chapman plays well, they'll opt out at the end of the season, and the Giants will have to start from scratch again. But I do believe these are better deals for the Giants and this organization than they would have been giving Snell seven years, 210, or Matt Chapman five years, 120, which were the types of contracts those players were looking for 
at the beginning of the offseason. So you look at the cumulative additions the Giants have made here, and they have delivered on so much of what fans have been asking for. They've added excitement. They've added dynamic athleticism. They've added strong starting pitching. And there's still the element of the prospects coming through the farm system who can help this team and make a big impact in 2024. Looking at Kyle Harrison in the rotation, looking at Mason Black, someone even like Landon Roop who had himself an outstanding spring training. On the field, Luis Matos had an outstanding spring. Uh, you know, I'm taping this before the Giants announced their opening day roster. It would not shock me if he got 400 at-bats this season, whether or not he's on or off the opening day roster. And then at shortstop, Marco Luciano had the brutal start to the spring, but man, what a tremendous end to the spring Luciano had. So I brought my friend Roger Munter on. It's a K-Rog podcast. You can find this in Roger's There Are Giants feed. You can find this here on YouTube on my channel. And thank you to everyone who's still subscribed, still tuned in. I know that the last month and a half, we haven't produced much content for this channel. I promise you, there will be much more moving forward. I've got a much easier schedule with KMBR moving forward over the next few weeks. Instead of hosting just about every night, uh, it's more like one or two shows a week. And that means I can devote more time to coming on YouTube, some instant reactions to games big moments, transactions. We'll do all of that throughout this 2024 Giants season that promises to be a heck of a lot more exciting than it was when I first started this channel way back when. So thanks to everyone for tuning in. Here's Roger. Well, there has been big, big news since uh, the last time we got together. Um, and I am definitely going to ask Kerry Crowley about his European vacation uh, while I have him here. Um, but before we get to that, it's time to talk Giants because things have changed since the last K-Raj. Uh, I am here, Roger Munter, joined with my friend Kerry Crowley to talk about these changes. Kerry, how are you doing? Oh, couldn't be better, Roger. So glad that we can do a K-Raj before opening day and so glad that after an off season of saying, will the Giants ever do anything? that, hey, they didn't just do something. Uh, they went from a soft rebuild to they're all in on this season. So it uh, makes uh, many of our former episodes or past episodes irrelevant now, but I think that's a good thing. I, You know, I think if you went back to maybe the first ones of these we did, and we said, what is the, what's the off season need to look like? It ended up looking a lot like that. Um, not in the, not at the pace that we were hoping for or the timing we were expecting, but they knocked off just about everything on our shopping list. Plus more, uh, they did more actually than I expected them to this, this off season. And that's pretty exciting to see. I think. Yeah, I think it's, you know, you go back to 1993 when they signed Barry Bonds and nothing is going to match that in terms of free agency for the Giants as a franchise and what he meant, the caliber of player he was at the time, just kind of where the Giants were in history at that time, understanding that, you know, the team could have been headed to Tampa Bay and San Francisco would have been left without baseball. It's hard to say that anything stacks up against that, but you look at the all-time free agent classes that the Giants have brought in and the money that they spent this offseason, a, a Platinum Glover, a uh, reigning Cy Young Award winner, the best player in the KBO who was coming over to the United States in Jung Hoo Lee, uh, Jordan Hicks, not even among the top three acquisitions if we're yeah. discussing the offseason. And I mean, the the marvelous stuff that he clearly brings to the mound as a pitcher. And so it, it's it's really hard for me to complain about anything right now because I spent so much at the beginning of the offseason, Roger, just pounding the table saying, oh, this is not an organization that's hungry. It's an ownership that doesn't want to win. And they've kind of quieted me. I had a a reader write in that we needed a ding a bell every time you mentioned that uh, Farhan Zaidi could get fired if things went poorly. Um, That's still true. That's still that, true. True. <laughs> Even more so. I'm going to ring my bell. I, you know, but what I think is very exciting is, I mean, I, we talked about, you know, they've been really good at these sort of marginal small moves that are upgrades. Could they be bold? And what we've ended up is an off season where they did both. I mean, Tom Murphy is, we saw that last night, really good guy to have the roster, really good marginal upgrade. Um, Jordan Hicks is another really interesting kind of pitching acquisition that like, if it works well, it's going to be a blockbuster. It's going to be like Kevin Goss, picking Kevin Gossman up for $6 million after he'd been released by the Reds and turning him into a Cy Young contender. And yet they also get last year's Cy Young award winner 
and they also get a multi time all-star platinum glove winner they got the top of the market and they got the cool little markets and uh, and without even talking about young who lee who yes is the best player in the kbo for several years running and on top of that they're layering in all of these guys have been their top prospects for years so you've got the cool veteran and youth thing going together this is an exciting roster this is now i mean we've been saying boy this is risky what are they doing how is it going to come together now I look at this roster and say, yeah, I expect these guys to go to the postseason. I expect yeah. expect to see them playing meaningful baseball in October. Uh, I can't remember the last time I said that about a Giants team uh, at this time of year. Exactly, because we also didn't say it entering 2021. Like that was right, not right. something that was on our radar. They blessed the Giants universe with 107 <laughs> wins and made it a season to remember. But there hasn't been this much hype around a Giants team since what? 2016 because that's when they acquired Jeff Johnny Cueto and Jeff Samarja and I know that Samarja you know a lot of fans felt like they overpaid for him and I get it but at the same time they were coming off of the even year magic back then and there was still a ton of belief you had Brandon Crawford Buster Posey Brandon Belt in their primes and so it's just hard to think about a time in recent memory when the Giants have had the potential to be this compelling and this entertaining and I look at the rotation, Roger, from the time that we began spring training and saying, okay, they've got Logan Webb, there's some excitement in Kyle Harrison, and there's a big question mark in Jordan Hicks to what the Giants have now put together. And it's a rotation to where you can say, I think they can win today. And you can say that every day. And I always think in baseball, you're not as you're only as good as the starting pitcher that day, which of course, bullpenning uh, made that difficult for me to say because the Giants still would string <laughs> together pretty good bullpen games, uh, as frustrating as that may be for the viewer. But I think you can look at this group and say they've absolutely got a chance to win. And Jung Hu Lee has a chance to be exciting on the bases. Matt Chapman will play great defense at third. Uh, there are guys in this lineup who can do damage. And no, it's probably not going to be a top 10 offense in Major League Baseball. But you can just see an identity and a path to winning developing that hasn't existed for years. And it's quite frankly what Giants fans deserve. And so that's what's really nice to see. Yeah, absolutely. And I think something else we talked about a lot this this winter is, you know, we don't want Kyle Harrison to have the pressure of being number two. <laughs> We'd like to see him develop into a number two. And he's going to take that spot, I think, uh, uh, kind of ceremonially uh, this week. But he doesn't have the burden of being that they do have Logan Webb. They do have Blake Snell. They do have Alex Cobb. I saw him twice uh, at minor league camp this week. He is not going to be long. Uh, at some point, Robbie Ray may come back. They may have to think about, well, do we keep Jordan Hicks uh, or Keaton win in the, in the rotation, or are we going to six man rotation? They're going to, you know, and in a best world and knock on, I will knock on wood. They have those decisions to make in the second half. Yeah. Um, and Harrison can bloom kind of at his own at his own pace without feeling the pressure of I'm the only guy here to provide innings. Um, yeah, I just feel like they nailed it. I mean, you were so your colleague Grant Brisby. I think he he said he put this really well that they didn't. It's not like they had a a whiteboard somewhere in the offices that said we must sign Blake Snell and Matt Chapman with like six. Uh, exclamation marks and some underlines it's we're going to do the smart prudent thing which is what they always do and the market fell to them uh mm -hmm. you know they played a good game of chess as as it turned out uh they didn't go out aggressively and get it but they played the long game and it came to them and it's just like you know when you get tim lincecum or you get buster posey to a certain degree you get them because a bunch of other teams didn't didn't take them away from you um it's kind of the same thing here. They get this great off season in large sense because other teams didn't want to go do it, but they did do it. And, yeah. uh, and they deserve a ton of credit for that. Yeah. There's, there's something to be said for changing your approach and taking risks. And I think that that's what giants fans have been clamoring for throughout the Farhan Zaidi era is there've been risks, but they've been risks that are small. They've been risks that they can get out of. And you could even argue that Blake Snell and Matt Chapman aren't significant risks because combined the max amount that they could pay those guys if things go extremely poorly is $116 million. And at the beginning of the offseason, you would have said, oh, five for 115, maybe that feels right for Chapman. It's probably an overpay, but I'm so hungry for a star that I do it at this point. And so I think that the way that they've structured this offseason while bringing in the premium talent and still avoiding those big time risks that can hamper a franchise like a 
Carlos Rodon contract is threatened to hamper the New York Yankees in their rotation. That's really good. So I, I want to get into our expectations, Roger. But before I do that, I want to ask you about your trip to Arizona because you've been in the desert. You've seen the, the kids in the farm system and uh, Bryce Eldridge is making noise, but he's not the only one. Uh, yeah, I, I just last night got back from from 10 days in the desert, my my annual trip to Papago, um, which I, my my aim is always to get as get my eyes on as many players who I've never seen play before live as I can um, when that's the best place to do it all in one place. Uh, as it turned out, I also got to see like Camilo Duvall and uh, <laughs> Alex Cobb. You know, the Giants have a way of sending them at the big guys over there. Um, but it is a pretty exciting group of players. Uh, and and particularly there are some of these young bats who are really exciting. Uh, Bryce Eldridge, the last day I was there was Saturday and Eldridge was just kind of putting on a display. His power potential is crazy yeah. uh and he's not near done i mean he's a tall 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 dude but he is thin he has room to pack on muscle and he's going to be much much stronger soon but i just think his bat's so quick and his thought his decision making at the plate is so good uh there's huge offensive upside in him and also rainer arias who is like what's playing on the same field with eldridge and, and walker martin much older players. And every time I talk to a Giants official, they'd say, we have to remind ourselves this guy's 17 <laughs> yeah, because he doesn't play like he's 17. I mean, you can see that his dad was, you know, is a longtime scout and he's been around the game his whole life. Um, another guy who was really exciting was uh, Maui Ahuna, who was their fourth year pick last year. A uh, Hawaiian player uh, came from Tennessee and he didn't play at all last year. Uh, they said he put on 20 pounds and I'm like looking at him going, boy, where, where'd he put it? Because yeah, I, I would I, love I don't to see have it. that problem. <laughs> Very wiry, strong kid, really fluid in the field, really athletic looking. Um, yeah. The, the, it, it It is really interesting to me that we've got to this point where after many years, we have starting to get the best prospects onto the major league team. And all of a sudden now they're building a new wave that's sort of, you know, phase two, and it's going to be a few years for those guys, but there's a, there's some growing talent there. Um, there were a few players who I didn't get to see. And I think there's some lingering injuries in camp, uh, uh, unfortunately. Um, but it was an exciting, it was an exciting week. Yeah. I mean, 10 days in the desert. I'm extremely jealous. This is the first <laughs> spring training I've missed since the spring of 2011. So I've gone every single year since then. And uh, I'm incredibly disappointed, especially because I would have loved <laughs> to spend some time over at the uh, the minor league camp. For as fun as this Giants major league team looks, uh, you just touched on a ton of prospects. So I do have to ask you, you talked about a bunch of position players and it's great for Giants fans to hear that because how long has it been since they had a homegrown core coming up of position players who they could uh, potentially think about and rely on and it's you know you go back to the days of Buster Posey Brandon Belt Brandon Crawford Joe Panic, Pablo Sandoval in the infield uh, which pitchers caught your eye well, I, I will say that I, I didn't get to see some of these pitchers because a lot of them are still at uh, Major League Camp. That's true. You know, Landon, Landon Roop. Roop and, uh, Mason. I did actually see Mason Black pitch, uh, throw five innings there uh, one day. Um, I I saw Carson Wisenhunt once, and I think it was his first uh, day of pitching to batters uh, in the spring. So he was a little rougher. He was a little rugged. He was still trying to kind of like dial it in. Uh, I saw Hayden Birdsong a couple of times and you know, Birdsong is just has such a high ceiling. I still think he's a kid who doesn't really know yet how good he's going to be, uh, but huge arm. Uh, and that, that curveball is incredible. Um, I got to see Joe Whitman a couple of times and he's, yeah. he's a, who was their second round pick last year. Really good slider. That slider is probably going to give him a big league career of some nature uh, because it is really good. And we'll see how the, the other things develop around it. Um, gee, who else did I see? Who who pitched here? Joe Whitman uh, was going to be the guy who I was going to ask you about because I did see some of the highlights leaking out on social media of what he's done down there. So uh, I'm I'm glad you touched on him. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's still, yeah, I, I like any young pitcher coming out of college, there there are things to see how how it goes. Uh, the changeup looks like it needs to. Uh, uh, you know, some development and the changeup will help the fastball. Uh, but that slider is a killer pitch uh, and he really kind of varies the shape of it. Uh, a tremendous weapon he has. Um, I also saw 
Randy Rodriguez at his best. That's um, right. One of my last days there where it was just everything was in the strike zone. 40 man well, pitcher Randy zone. Rodriguez. Yeah, on his last option year. So he needs to make an impression this year um, because you get it to where you're out of options and you haven't shown something at the major league level. And that's that's when you start hitting the, the waiver wire roulette. And I really, he kind of reminds me of Gregory Sa- um Gregor Santos. I don't want to see them lose him to to bloom with somebody else. Yeah. Um, he he he's got to throw more strikes and he knows that. But when he throws strikes, his stuff is, you know, it's not quite Camilo Duvall, but it's in that neighborhood. His his fastball and slider are both great pitches. Uh, so he was fun to watch. That's awesome. I I I love I love hearing about all these guys and uh just reminds me, so, you know, covering spring training for five years, I always had good stories to write about. Spring training is the best time of the year yeah. in the major league clubhouse. But the day or two that you get to go over to minor league camp, it's like a, a whole different world. And I recommend it to to anyone who has the opportunity to do so. I should I should throw a shout out to to Eric Silva, who was. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, I th- I think the fifth round pick uh, back in 2021 uh, and he had, a, he had a rough year last year where both his stuff looked down and he just didn't look confident in his pitching. Uh, it was a difficult year all around, but uh, he was really back to where he was, you know, two years ago when I first saw him as, as an 18 year old, uh, he was sitting 95, 96, hitting 97. The sweeper looked good. The slider looked good. Uh, he throws a curve. He throws a change up. He throws a sinker. He throws everything. Um, so, you know, I think this this needs to be the year where it starts showing up on the field for him. But it, that was a really exciting outing, too. Yeah. So Rogers trip to the desert pays off a uh, ton of great insight, ton of great analysis. So um, let's let's talk a little bit about expectations for this 2024 season, because we kind of recap the off season, talked about your uh, your minor league experience. Love to hear it because you mentioned you can uh, you're envisioning October baseball for this team. And I think I am, too. What gives you that confidence compared to kind of the other teams in the National League right now that the Giants will will get one of those six spots? Well, I mean, the part of it is something we talked about, um, you know, a couple months ago that, you know, once you got past the Dodgers and the Braves, the National League was essentially was a big scrum of kind of. I don't want to say mediocrity, but teams that project in that low 80s win total and it doesn't take a lot to break out. And since we were having those conversations, they did add Matt Chapman. They did add Blake Snell. Um, that's a lot of talent to bring. Those are difference makers. Uh, I, you know, I like, I look around at teams like Arizona and I like what they did adding Eduardo Rodriguez, but Eduardo Rodriguez is not Blake Snell, you know, yeah. <laughs> and it's, um, uh, Eugenio Suarez isn't Matt Chapman. So, <laughs> you know, I think they added difference makers and I think, Bob Melvin's a difference maker too. I think we know that this club was not, you know, as, as the old cliches go, they weren't all pulling on the same oar uh, yeah. down the stretch. And that contributed to what was a woeful last two months of the season that caused them to fall out of a position they'd worked for four months to get into. I don't think that's going to happen under Bob Melvin. And I think you're hearing kind of tone shifts from people, um, I heard a conversation from Logan Webb. I really do think it's going to be a more competitive, hungrier club and hopefully, I don't know, more professional one. Is that the right term? Yeah. Uh, and and then I do think there are these kind of high upside injections in here, having Young Hoot Lee, um, having Kyle Harrison, having Landon Roop. I mean, Juan Sanchez, who is a kid I have always loved. And still Marco Luciano, all these guys are sort of in there as players who don't necessarily have to be all-star seasons. They can take small steps, but small steps that are meaningful around the edge of what's already a pretty good roster. Yeah. And I also think guys like Michael Conforto, we saw Michael Conforto for a month last year, make a difference for this club. And then, you know, his legs went under him and, and he had a tough half of the season. But there's a lot of veteran talent around here that can be much better than we saw last year, too. I think it all comes together to make a pretty competitive club. 
Yeah, I, I did want to touch on uh, Marco Luciano just because he's been a story of the last two weeks now after getting off to a horrendous start during spring training. I think he was like one for a, a big number, like one for 17, one for 18, one for 19 with like 11 strikeouts. Strikeout total really hasn't gone down, but the power has shown up. Hits one off the scoreboard at Scottsdale Stadium. I think he's got uh, entering Tuesday's exhibition, four straight games with an extra base hit. Uh how long do we wait to see Marco Luciano become the everyday shortstop for this team, Roger? I, I just want to say not the first scoreboard I have seen Marco Luciano <laughs> hit the top of in my life. If it were me, I would say Thursday. Yeah. I, I still would keep him on this club. I would too. And, you know, no disrespect to Nick Ahmed, but he's 35 years old. He's been in decline for several years. The last couple of years have not looked good. The projections don't look good. I think if you're serious about winning, you maybe don't start a year with a shortstop who you are almost intending to DFA in a in a, in a month's time. You go with the best talent. And I still think Luciano is that, even though he's raw, even though he hasn't had much time at AAA. I've, I said this over and over again. This is what Luciano does. He comes to a level. He strikes out a massive amount of times. He looks <laughs> overwhelmed and then he catches up. And when he catches up, he catches up with a vengeance. I I saw the first week of his high A career. I saw the first couple of weeks of his double A career. This is what it looks like. There's going to be this period where he looks overmatched and he strikes out 50% of the time for a couple of weeks and then he starts making the adjustments and that's what he's always done. And I yeah. think that's what he's doing right now. And I, I would rather have him do that in April than have him do that in June when he gets called up or July yep. when he gets called up after you've seen Nick Ahmed do something similar, probably yeah. if, if his offensive numbers for his major league career are indicative of what to expect. So I'm right there with you. And uh, I think he's made it an interesting conversation and the giants before we put this out there, will probably made their decision on Nick Ahmed and Marco Luciano and what they do at shortstop. But uh, the other guy who has forced his way into the picture. And again, this is another decision we could know of right after we finished taping this podcast because of Austin Slater's elbow, but it's Luis yeah. Matos who had a great off season, clearly put on the weight that the giants wanted to see from him. Great power during spring training. I don't know, Roger, I've said this on KMBR several times now. I don't know that Luis Matos isn't worse than the second best outfielder on this giants team right now on this 40 man roster right now. Uh, I'd put young who Lee as the number one guy. And if you were betting on who was going to have the best season of Conforto, Yastrzemski, Slater, uh, I don't count Solaire as an outfielder <laughs> uh, <laughs> because you don't want him picking up a glove. I might say Luis Matos is number two. Can, I can't believe, I think this is our first Solaire reference uh, in this <laughs> show, know. which tells you how good their offseason was. So many years in, in Giants history, Jorge Solaire would have been the best offseason acquisition they made. Uh, yeah. And I still expect him to have a big, big impact on this team. Um, I, I I guess I, I, I've i been saying all along, there's going to be a lot of at-bats for Matos because we just know the injury history of these guys. Uh, and I'd rather have him giving you 350 or 400 good at-bats than having the next wave give you 300 bad at bats, you know, whoever that is, Elliot yeah. Ramos or, or Wade Meckler. So I, 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 I tend to view that through a, it's going to work itself out. And yet I don't think anybody's going to be surprised if Austin Slater spends two weeks on the IL. And when he comes back, there's no job for him. Yeah. I mean, that could easily happen with Louis Matos and that would be a good thing. Yeah, and and no one's going to be surprised about it. I think that's going to happen at some point this year, whether it's a Mikey Strzemski hamstring or it's Michael Conforto, you know, not having a bounce back. I kind of think Conforto is going to be better this year. Somewhere, some way, he's going to have a foot in the door, and when he takes and runs with it, it'll be his job at that point. You mentioned the three hundred, uh, you know, four hundred at bats that Matos could take if one of these guys gets hurt, and that's inevitable. We know that that happens with Slater, Strzemski, Conforto. Um, even Jung Hu Lee is coming off a season where he he missed time due to injury in Korea. Uh, but you also brought up the idea of the players behind Matos, Meckler and Ramos uh, getting at bats. And Meckler had a great spring. I know mm -hmm. the Giants fans 
weren't falling in love with his game when he was up with the major league team at the end of last season. But I think that I do wonder if the change from Melvin to Kapler will help someone like, uh, like made like Wade Meckler um, because Melvin just has this history of bringing guys to the major league level and seeing them succeed and put them in situation where they concede. Uh, the other guy who I wanted to ask you about how far off the major league radar is Ismael Mungia. Mungi, huh. I, I I absolutely love this kid, and I've always loved him. I love watching him play, and I don't know anybody who doesn't love watching him play. Exactly. But also, he is just the the best guy in the world, and uh, he's always up. He's always got a lot of energy. He's always helping his teammates. Uh, he's just a dream in kind of every way. Uh, he so Ismail Mungia is a is a very small person. You don't always get this off off cameras right because cameras center everybody up wade meckler is not a big human being mungia is much smaller than than meckler right but he he plays with so much energy and he plays so hard um that he makes up for that uh he's had injury history the last few years and some of that is that the game takes a toll on him because he's so small yeah um and he isn't always the perfect swing decision guy that this uh, this organization tends to prize, um, but I would put nothing past Ishmael. He's he he is a real performer, and he's a guy who cares about winning. He's very competitive, and he always goes out there and sort of shines in the big moments. I don't know if the whole package leads to him having a sustained career. I think he's going to play in the majors at some point, and when he does, people will love him. He'll be a cult star. Um, if things break right and he stays healthy, yeah, he could play in the major leagues. Uh, I'd, I'd and, love to see it. I really and I, I think actually, in some ways, the package is better than Meckler's because he does have a little more power. He is a little stronger uh, yeah. uh, than Meckler, and he, he can get the ball over the fence. Um, it would help both of those guys to improve their center field roots. I'll say that. Yeah. Uh, uh, both of them could stand a little improvement defensively, and that'll be the difference maybe in them them being in the majors, I'd say. One thing that I, I just envision is, you know, like a Jung Hu Lee single, he stretches it into a double. Uh, you've got Jorge Soler hitting a home run in an inning. Uh, you know, you, you've got uh, Mungi coming off the bench as a pinch runner at some point and taking an extra base and getting fired up. There's just so many different things that you can picture with this Giants team that you couldn't picture with the last two rosters that they put together. Yeah. I mean, there just wasn't, you know, I, you, you don't picture anything when you think of Michael Conforto on the base, on, on the baseball diamond. You don't picture anything when you think of Mitch Hanniger on the baseball diamond. Ross Stripling, Alex Wood. I mean, Alex Wood, you, you think of the fast delivery. But for the most part, replacement level players are replacement level in the memories that they create for you. <laughs> and I think that there's like just a real benefit to having someone like Matt Chapman who... Is there a difference between him and J.D. Davis? If you look at the back of the baseball card, it's incremental. If you look at their war and you watch them play, it's significant. Matt Chapman creates memories. J.D. Yeah. Davis plays baseball for you. And that's not, not, you know, not to disrespect Davis or any of those players who I mentioned, but these guys have a real impact on our enjoyment of the game. Yeah, I mean, I already have mental images of Matt Chapman making defensive plays. He he made one the other day. I was yeah. like, okay, when I think of Matt Chapman, I'm going to think of that. Uh, we're going to see Jorge Soler hit balls this year that we are going to remember. Um, you know, the way you do, I'm sure you remember the ball Andres Galarraga hit oh. you know, <laughs> almost up to the glove. Like, there are going to be balls like that that we'll talk about for, for, for 20 years maybe. And hopefully Luciano too. You know, there's something kind of ironic about uh, or, or poetic or whatever. Nick Ahmed last year was was released by the Diamondbacks on their way to a World Series so they could make room for a shortstop who was not ready yet. Yeah. Right. Jordan Lawler was not really ready to be a major leaguer, but they looked at the they looked at the room and said, why don't we give this kid an opportunity to be here and experience this we we know what we have in Nick Ahmed and it's not the future. Uh, and I like the decision they made and and I hope the Giants make that too. And and yeah, memories are going to come from that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the one thing that we haven't talked about is this Giants bullpen and they could make the decision on Juan Sanchez. He could be on this major league uh, roster. He's someone who really was not on my radar, uh, but let, let's talk about the bullpen at large and then Sanchez potentially being the second lefty down there. 
I, I, I'm going to take the second half of your question first. Uh, <laughs> please go. I remember seeing Juan Sanchez three years ago, and he had a really good breaking ball, and he threw 88. And then I saw him the next year at spring, and he had a really good breaking ball and a pretty decent change, and he was throwing 91. And then I saw him last year in Richmond, and he's throwing 93, 94, and the changeup has really come on, and he's got this great deception because of his delivery. And then I I see him this spring, and he's throwing 96, 97. Yeah. And I'm like, and it's really physical. I mean, he's put in the work to strengthen himself, to tone up the body. Even last year, there was some softness there. Uh, he's put in the work every step of the way, and every year he shows up and is better. And, you know, you can't ask for much more than that, than somebody who has worked their way up from the DSL to AAA through hard work and 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 proving out on the field. Uh, so he deserves a chance kind of in the way that Sergio Romo once deserved a chance, yeah. right? Because he just kept succeeding and he did everything he wanted to see. So I hope Juan Sanchez uh, – Opens the season, I think for sure he'll be around at some point this season. And next season, you know, he's going to be a guy who's around because he throws strikes and he is funky and he has pretty decent stuff. It's not like knock you out stuff, but it's good stuff. Um, I think what's fun about the bullpen is we're going to see a lot of homegrown guys. We're going to Ryan Walker was the beginning of of some things that are going to happen. We're going to see Landon Roop. We may see Keaton Wynn as part of that bullpen. Um, we may see Mason Black as part of that bullpen. It's going to be a lot of these arms that have been bubbling up through the system that I think are going to take that you know tenth, eleventh, twelve, eleven, twelve, thirteen spots um, yeah. in in the pen. Um, and I think they're going to use kind of multi-inning guys to get through, you know, if Jordan Hicks needs help or, uh, you know, Wynn or Harrison needs help. Um, but it's going to be a lot of young homegrown arms that that I've been watching for the last few years and have really good stuff. So I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, it could be could be the most fun giant season for you in a long time because of all the guys who are coming up. Uh, There's the no doubt about that. Who you've been covering. So. Yeah, do you, I, I think do you that... remember, Kerry, once like two years ago or three years ago, you asked me on KNBR, I said, what are the best pitches in the Giants organization? And I know for a fact, I said Landon Roop's curveball. You, you in 100% that conversation. did say that. Yes, <laughs> that is a fact. We'll have to go. We'll have to go back and pull the tape. Something that uh, that I know that KNBR can do. But uh, but we should pull the tape on that because Landon Roop's curveball has been the talk of spring training and. I, I think they're actually in an, an interesting position, Roger. Maybe we close with this. There are a lot of guys who can, should, will be on this 40-man roster who aren't on it yet, which means that they're going to have some difficult decisions, not just in the next few days, but potentially in the next few weeks and certainly in the next few months. Yeah, for sure. Um, they're going to have to have at least three spots Thursday and possibly four, depending on what they do with the Ahmed decision. Yeah, they're there. I was just writing this morning. Um, and I, I hate to say this, but there are guys who you can see are really on the bubble right now. And one of them is probably Elliot Ramos, who it yeah. does seem the organization has turned a page on. Um, one of them could be David VR, who was, you know, such a happy story a, a year or so ago. Um they are going to have some tough decisions. You know, 60 day stuff kind of helps out, but I don't know how they're it seems like they're really close to the second CBT, which could also factor in how much money they want to spend on things. It's going to be difficult making 40 man decisions this week and all year because there, there's talent coming. Uh, you know, Carson Woods and Hudson's not going to be on the roster Thursday, but he's going to be on the roster at some point. Yeah. Um, so yeah, these decisions are coming. I don't know. Do you, I don't want to make any predictions about people losing their jobs, but uh, maybe we can make predictions about people gaining jobs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and you, that will do talked, the trick. You've talked me in, I don't know. Everything I read is that it's going to be Nick Ahmed, but everything that I've seen and everything that you just said tells me it should be Marco Luciano uh, come Thursday, because I'd rather live with uh, him and figuring out with him and then Tyler Fitzgerald and Casey Schmidt behind him than you know, giving Ahmed a job for what could be two weeks if Luciano continues that hot, this hot stretch at AAA Sacramento, and you'd hate to lose another player because of that. Yeah, uh, you know, if it means that Elliot Ramos is outside the organization at the beginning of the year, you know, your outfielders get hurt 
You know, you, yeah. you know what these guys injury track record looks like. So uh, Sanchez is going to be someone who has to be added to the roster, right? He's someone yeah. who's, yeah, he's someone who has to be added. And I think that'll happen. And uh, who else? I mean, the Mason Roop would Black's have to be added. Yeah. Mason Black would have to be added. Oh, Mason Black would have to be added. Okay. Yeah, he's I'll not on the 40 the man. Landon Roop isn't on the 40 man. Juan Sanchez isn't on the 40 man. Obviously, Nick Ahmed isn't on the 40 man. Um, Dalton Jeffries. Dalton Jeffries is not on the 40 man. Yeah. So yeah. almost whoever they choose for those last three spots on the pitching staff, unless, you know, Eric Miller gets a comeback or, or something, or, or Sean Jelly suddenly is healthy. I, those three slots are all going to come off the 40 man. I think. Yeah. It's a really interesting time. And, uh, who knows? Maybe by the time that, uh, that we, po- that we post this, <laughs> the Giants will have made their decisions. Well, I, I, I'm just, I'm excited that we're, we're so excited today. No, yeah. I feel like we've spent so much time uh, on the on the K Rod saying when's going to happen. Oh, why aren't they doing this? A bit kind of negative trend. Uh, today feels really positive, which is what the end of spring training should feel like. Yeah, it's so much better to do this episode when you feel good about the direction. You're excited about the team that you're going about. You're about to watch for 162 games because I'll tell you. Uh, there were some dark days during uh, during the second half of last season watching Giants baseball. There were some days where maybe I said I was watching and uh, and maybe I wasn't. But uh, this is this is really fun, and I, I'm so glad that the K Raj podcast has led us to this point, Roger. Where opening day is on the horizon. That's right, and uh, there's no better two words in in the English language than opening day. So uh, uh, have a very good one, Carrie, and I hope everyone listening has a great one as well. Thank you.